Starting now, this is Real People. Real issues, real news, real people. I'm Stephanie Allensworth, and this is Real People. This is Real People. Hi, welcome to Real People. I'm Stephanie Allensworth. My guest today is the founder and president of Drawing Connections, Inc., Mr. Robert Teslo. Thanks for being here today, Robert. Thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm going to call you Bob from now on, if you don't mind. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. So tell us about Drawing Connections, Inc. Uh, it's a uh, passion of mine. Um, it started uh, actually in, with an idea in 2012. Um, I took a trip to Jamaica. Uh, my wife couldn't come with me. Uh, she told me to go what I needed to do, and that was a wonderful gift. Um, she let me go down, and I went down to the community that she and I have been going to since the early 70s. Um, and that community had a local school, Robbins Bay Primary School. And so when I got down there, I checked into the school uh, just to see what was going on. Here they're having a camp for the kids. And I thought, my gosh, now here's something that I could get involved in. So I went to the principal, Hyacinth Narayan. I knew her husband um, when he was a young boy of 18, and I've kept in touch with him. So I, I asked what I could do, and they said anything. Well, that was pretty open for me. And knowing that the camp was based on ecology and the environment, I wondered how I could fit my background of being a teacher for 45 years in art into their program. Wow, okay, so 45 years in art at Blake School? At Blake School. Very good, it's a very well-known school. Wonderful career. Yeah, so what kind of art? Let's, let's talk about the art itself for just a minute because I know you want to get back to the people. Sure, um, my art or the, the art of? The art, but, well, yeah, what you taught, what, what's oh. your? Um, well, I taught all of the classes. Um, Starting in 1969, it was only the boys' school out in Hopkins. And then the schools merged, and the first classes were in 74, 75. And that's when I moved myself in the upper school to the Northrop campus on Kenwood Parkway. Oh, OK. Um, and then I was teaching all the classes, every one of the classes at that time. Um, so it was painting, drawing, printmaking, um, ceramics, uh, a crafts class. I had all the different programs. Uh, finally, um, we needed more people to be teaching, and so we were able to get some great people, and then I started pulling back a bit, ending my career teaching only photography and printmaking. Okay, okay. So, okay, going back to Jamaica, I'm just yes. curious now, um, where were you in Jamaica? Well, it's a town called Robbins Bay, Jamaica. It's in the parish of St. Mary's. And Logistically, on the uh, island, where is that? Well, north, south, east, west? Yeah, let's say north coast, uh, more like northeast part of the island. Okay. Uh, directly north of Kingston, Kingston being on the south coast, um, this community being on the north. Uh, it's close to Anato Bay, which is the largest small town in the area. Um, but it's in, halfway in between Port Antonio and Ocho Rio, so okay. people may. Uh, recognize yep. that. Ocho Rios, I, I'm sure people sure. recognize that. So what brought you to Jamaica in the first place? You said you'd been going there for years with your wife. Right. Um, it, it was just a, uh, a trip that I took uh, spring break in the summer of 1972. Um, went down with a, a local family that had property in the area. And so I, I continued to keep going back to that same place, the same property. Um, in Robbins Bay uh, is a community that was um, just a few miles away from where I was staying and that whole town was really supported by the agricultural aspect of Greencastle Estate. That was the name of the property okay. that I stayed at. So ah. this whole little community of Robbins Bay was engaged in um, agriculture at that plantation. Okay, so it was a plantation. Alrighty. Right, it was a working plantation. And what kind of crops? Well, they had pimento, um, sugar cane, 
um, cattle. Did they do coffee too? I mean, uh, no, I know coffee Jamaica. isn't part of that. That parish isn't where the coffee comes from. Okay. That's Portland. Okay. So that's a little bit further east toward the Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm, right, Blue Mountain Coffee, yeah, sure. yeah. So every year you, you went back and? Nearly every year um, I went back. My wife and I would travel in the summer uh, down there. It was um, a good time to go. There was less people and uh, availability of a place to stay worked out that way as well right. during the summer. But then the, well, my wife and I were married there and. 1976. Oh, very nice. So we do, she and I both had this intense commitment and um, engagement with the people, the food, the music, and the smells of Jamaica. It's just yeah. a wonderful, wonderful place. Yeah, uh, my husband and I spent two weeks in Negril, so you, you get to know a lot of that, uh, the smells and the people. and. Just the hustle and bustle, but in a small community, I'm sure there was less hustle and bustle and more, more. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, so let's get into uh, the school again. Go, going yeah. back to the school and drawing connections and what actually blossomed out of that. Well, th that was the summer of 2012 that I was referring to, and it wasn't until uh, summer of 2013 that I actually then become became directly involved with the camp and actually um, bringing some of my background as far as teaching art to the school. So what I had thought, even though this, this is ecology and environmental camp, that if, if I were able to help students and community members learn how to see a little bit differently than you or I might just casually see, but in order to be able to see, in order to enhance drawing, that if they were able to accomplish that, then they may be able to look at their environment, the oncology around it, recognize things that might not be quite right, and make some changes and differences for their community. So that's how I wove drawing into the program. Right, right, so seeing with a new set of eyes. Basically. Absolutely, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how did, that, how did that work for them, to, uh, incorporating uh, j tell me how that works. What do you do? You have, like I, I heard of turning the drawing upside down as you're doing it, and and looking at it from an alternate alternative perspective. But what what was your? Well, Stephanie, you're very knowledgeable about that. I can tell. You know, but <laughs> it, one of the things is 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 um, my master's degree uh, from the University of Minnesota. My my paper was called enhancing line contour drawing through tactile exploration. So the idea about being able to draw. Um, what you see is based on tactile feelings, and so I developed strategies uh, for students to learn how to draw through first touching something, not necessarily drawing it, but touching it and feeling it, and drawing what they felt rather than what they saw. So that's how that started. And so I actually have them put objects into a bag that's opaque, they can't see through it, and touch it with their untrained hand and then use a pencil in their other hand onto a sketchbook and draw what they feel as they're moving their hand around the edges of the object. Then they draw at the same rate, hopefully, what they feel, not what they see. Oh, wow, that is amazing. And does it help to be ambidextrous or anything? I mean, do they have to be? Or, I mean, does no. it really shine if they do? No, what, they it, are? what it is is, is just a, um, bringing in another sense. Right. Uh, and touch being a very, very important one for us all. Uh, bringing that together with the idea of how the pencil is going across the paper and having that sense of place and space. Uh, is very helpful for the student to be able to take a look and draw what they are feeling rather than what they're thinking or drawing what they're seeing rather than what they are thinking. So in order for us to draw, we need to really be able to see well and not base it on something that we've experienced before and have a kind of a map of it in our head. That is so cool. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to envision what that would be like <laughs> without being able to actually see it, so I have to use the old mind's eye. Uh, uh, it sounds so cool, but I was thinking it would be like what happens when a blind person touches someone's face and they, 
they get an idea for what the person would look like, I guess, in, in their mind's eye by touching. Is it similar to that? Well, yeah, I think it is. And then it's so much more intimate as far as making a connection between people and objects mm -hmm. when you're just looking at that one thing, like a person next to you, like we're this close together, Stephanie, mm -hmm. and we're drawing each other, we're making a real connection. And that's what I wanted to make sure that I did with students, uh, not only students at Blake, but also students in Robbins Bay. I mean, I saw a lot of students at Blake going on wonderful trips around the world, and they'd come back with really great experiences, and yet I thought they probably could get more out of their experiences rather than playing uh, football, soccer. Mm -hmm. um, maybe doing this drawing idea would bring people closer together, making more positive connections, and, and also have it so that there wasn't some kind of a competitive nature like soccer would be. Mm. You know, this doesn't have that competitive edge to it, and so it seems to be much more direct and connected. Wow, that's why they call it drawing connections, that's right? That's why they call it drawing connections, right? So I can just imagine the looks on their faces when they pull out their object and see what it really is compared to what they draw. I mean, does it really just tickle them that they're doing this, or do they surprise themselves a uh, lot? They do, do surprise Do they surprise them. you? They surprise me, they surprise themselves, and they surprise their uh, peers and their family members. So uh, after I give them some instruction, um, I ask them to take that instruction and bring it home and instruct someone in the home, either a sibling or a parent or a grandparent, someone else, so that they are taking what they have learned, been engaged in in the classroom, and bringing it home to share it with other people. Okay. Sharing is an important aspect of this whole thing as well. Right, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. So do you go outside of Jamaica as well to other places, other countries? Well, I, I have traveled since my wife passed away. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, I have made some uh, sojourns. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I recognize at that point, uh, going to South America, um, that when I'm out drawing on a beach, people are watching and seeing what I'm doing. And a young boy, about the age of 10, and that's the age I work with in Jamaica, 10 and 11, they're, they are fifth graders. Um, he was watching me draw and I put my things away and he came back and indicated to me that he wanted to draw. I mean, I could see this. We didn't speak the same language. But there was a connection that we were making. Mm -hmm. And it was actually through this drawing thing that he saw me doing. And so when he came up to me and gestured this idea about drawing, I said, no, either you're gonna be doing the drawing and I want you to use your eyes to draw what you see. And you know what? This young man picked up the pencil and the paper and was just totally engaged with this process. So Stephanie, I know that this drawing connections with people can happen anywhere. There's no doubt about that. Is that a goal then, to, to take it on a road show, if you will? Well, I'd like to take it to different places, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, Robbins Bay Primary School has really been a wonderful pilot place mm -hmm. that I've not only done the drawing aspect, but I've done some painting as well. And then also, if started to engage and expand the program to enhance it beyond the um, ecology and the environment to add two other layers, and that is career awareness and skill development. Mm. So on, the, on this foundation that the camp was based on, um, I've added the two other aspects so that students have an opportunity to find out what it really takes if they want to be a pediatrician. Um, and so all these kinds of things came up because the, I started doing interviews with not only the Robbins Bay fifth graders, but also um, classes of fifth graders in Minneapolis as well. And I started out with Blake School at their Hopkins campus, and then I went to Anderson Elementary and worked with them. Um, and then I came, came back to Blake, um, working with this exchange of 
um, interviews using the same prompts, Stephanie, so that students had an opportunity then when they viewed them to be able to make some comparisons. Recognize that indeed there are some similarities between us as people 2,000 miles away or themselves as young kids 2,000 miles away and there are some differences too and that's what makes us really human to be able to do that. So we're, we're talking about critical thinking skills here as well. Mm -hmm. So that's all part of the program. So do they have an opportunity to sell some of their artwork as well? And, or do you do any type of exhibit where people uh, can actually come and see it? Yeah, interesting. I just, just this year we're starting to exchange artwork. So I'll be bringing down this April artwork from Blake, fifth grade class from Highcroft campus. Ah. Uh, they also have written artist statements so that the students in, in Jamaica can also read the statements, gain some understanding through that. Students in Jamaica will be responding to those in written form and then bringing back artwork that they produce in Robbins Bay and I'll be bringing that back to the Highcroft kids. So they can, they can share each other's work and see each other's work. Right, now and you might ask, why don't we do this electronically? I wasn't right. going to ask that. Right. I, okay. I imagine it's because you would prefer to do it, it, it from the human aspect than well, be that, there in person. That's true, but there's no internet in Robin's oh. Bay. <laughs> so it, okay, good answer. Yeah, it's very, very <laughs> difficult to do that. I mean, the, the thing, things I have found that have been interesting that, that are similar, that are barriers, that are difficulties. I mean, families around the world are really quite a bit the same. So when I'm saying who do you live with? Uh, the kids in Robbins Bay and in, in Minnesota, they'll be talking about um, lots of different types of structures of families. There isn't a right or a wrong mm -hmm. kind of family. They're all just different. Um, but what was somewhat humorous was that when the kids uh, from Jamaica would listen to the American kids talk about who they lived with and their families, um, they would list their brother and sister, mother or a stepfather or however it might be, but then they'd also list their pets, especially their dogs. Mm -hmm. So then when the, I brought these down to Jamaica and would show the Jamaican kids, all of a sudden there's a lot of laughter going on when the dogs were mentioned. And I couldn't quite f figure it out and yet all of a sudden, oh my gosh, dogs are not part of the family oh. in Jamaica. They're not indoor pets. There's I a lot see. of dogs outside. I see. But not indoor pets. So that you know that was a little fun thing that the kids at Blake and at Robbins Bay had picked up on. Yeah, oh my gosh, fun. they're living where they're pets. And, and they actually not. let them in the house. Right. <laughs> let exactly. alone on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> they live with us and sleep with us and eat with us. Right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's it's, it is foreign. It's a foreign concept to people who who uh, don't never never lived like that. True. I imagine they come here and think, what's wrong with these people? Those animals belong outside. But they, you know, we're in Minnesota. <laughs> you can't leave your pets outside. <laughs> no, that's been difficult, yes, this yeah. winter. Right. Yeah, this, this winter in particular. But um, So what else have you, uh, have, are you, obviously I think you're looking for expanding this, right? And being able to do more with more schools and more people. You can't do it all yourself. Are you looking for other people to, to step mm -hmm. up and work with you and take your concept and expand it around the globe? Yeah, Stephanie, thanks for asking because the, the, my point is that I would like to, as I said, enhance this program. Mm -hmm. And the, the parts that are the enhancers would be these um, exchanges that go on between communities and the schools and the kids. Um, I've been self-funding that myself okay. and it's gotten to a point where I just can't can't do that anymore so I'm, I'm looking for support mm -hmm. for funding those April and November trips that I do for the recording and the exchanging of written and visual visual things okay um, I also have thought some of some other possibilities but right now I really want to make sure that drawing connections is on a good foundation. It's, it's 
you know, on its feet and can be sustainable. I, I don't want to leave this community without the opportunity and without the, the excitement that's going on right now with this program. Right, so could you train, train some of the people in Jamaica to, to yeah. step up, you know, when you can't be there and carry it, carry it over? Uh, absolutely, uh. Stephanie. Uh, my, uh, my, one of my first sessions down there was going to the sixth grade graduation. And they were giving awards away for academics and athletics. And I mentioned to a young man that was next to me, he is an intuitive, art, intuitive artist from the community. His name is Alan Richards. I said, Alan, isn't there an award for art? He said, no. I said, well, now there is. Mm -hmm. So we developed a plaque that has a spot for a plate to go on with the student's name that the Robbins Bay faculty and Alan Richards is the intuitive artist, select as the award winner. So that is one way that we can keep this going. I give it to a mm -hmm. fifth grader. It's not at the sixth grade graduation because we want to make sure that the award winner or those that are in that person's class the next year has someone to look up to and be able to say, you know what, this person won this award. Maybe I can get involved with it as well. I did mention Alan Richards, uh, an intuitive artist. He has had no formal instruction. So during the summer, I would teach him exactly the same techniques as I was teaching the students. And I'd also have a community adult with us as well. Okay. So we'd have, you know, Alan's an adult, but uh, he and uh, a parent are getting the same instruction. So I'm leaving that community with with at least two people a year that have this background and understanding. So indeed, if I weren't there, likely, certainly Alan could pick this up and, and run with it. So why fifth graders? Uh -huh. what's, what's special about that age? Developmentally, that's when um, hemispheres are starting to change around and the balance <laughs> starts to go one way or the other. And so based on my understanding of developmental stages of adolescence and young children, um, I've really gone to that age of 10, 10 and 11 years old, that fifth grade age, because that's when this right to left hemisphere shift tends to take place. So if they don't have any art, at that, by that time, it's likely that they never will. In the Ministry of Education in Jamaica, they are under a British system, being a former British mm -hmm. colony, mm -hmm. and their program doesn't have any art component until you get to high school. And high school actually starts in seventh grade. Oh. So these kids have had no formal art instruction because it's not important to the test that they'll be taking as sixth graders. Yeah, I see your point, <laughs> it, but it is important to to their development. It's, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a bit like back in the day when we the, our our teachers had us doing this creeping thing, you know, where you had to creep on your hands and knees to to retrain our brains apparently or our coordination. I, I don't re even really know what it was all about, <laughs> but but apparently it was a developmental thing that they were they were retraining us on, and. Um, and I, I find that really fascinating because I wasn't aware that that's when that happened. Like I, I guess I can say that I am an intuitive artist because I, the minute I could pick up a pencil, I was drawing. Uh -huh. And uh, my father had the good sense to recognize that because he was a doodler. He liked to doodle. And he always made cartoons. And I would watch him do cartoons, and I was always fascinated by how fast he could do them. And I started to emulate what he was doing. And then one day he went and bought me a whole set, I think, I think I was seven, and he bought me a whole set of colored pencils and a big tablet. And uh, I, uh, that's when everything took off for me. And I, I, I haven't drawn much lately, but it's, it's something that uh, I've, I'm very, very in tune with. Well, Stephanie, you're fortunate to have a parent um, that really supported your what you were doing. Yeah. 
Um, I know that there's been a lot of, a lot of stories about first marks. Mm -hmm. I like to think about first marks and how you might become aware of your first mark. I do recall my first mark and it was on a wall in my home and I was a very young boy and I wasn't scolded. Uh -huh. I was given paper to be able to make my second mark on. So it really so, worked out well. So by mark you mean you, you started drawing Actually pictures. made a mark, you know, and how important is it to recognize as an individual that you have an effect on your environment by making yeah. a mark. It's yeah. very crucial. Yeah, it's kind of hilarious. I, I have a, a book that was given to me, I think, for my seventh birthday as well, and I drew pictures in it. It was, it was a big book, and I drew a picture of myself with an arrow. It's like, this is me. <laughs> it's just really silly stuff. Oh, my goodness. This is, this is just awesome. Um, Oh boy, we got to wrap it up a little bit here because we're getting a little low on time. But I want to, everyone to know out there in, in uh, the audience that's watching and will be on YouTube that uh, you, could, you could stand some donations and we're going to be putting up your, your site for the uh, 50, 5013Cs so that you can get some donations. And hopefully we can facilitate getting you going. Okay, and on that note, I gotta say thank you for being here with us today, Real People. I'm Stephanie Allensworth. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank so you. So much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless. God bless you. My goodness. That's the first time they're like, ah, five seconds. <laughs> <laughs>